Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Footy Travellers Podcast. Hey, hey, it's Mike here, wanting to let you all know that today's episode is about me. Just me, nothing less, and especially nothing more. <clears throat> so, on this episode of the Footy Travelers podcast, we're going to do a little time traveling. Uh, excuse me, Mike? Uh, yes, yes, can I help you? <laughs> can you help me? Yeah, hey. <laughs> It's Colin, your co-host, like Colin Jost, remember? You uh you gonna introduce me here or you just gonna make this all about you today? <laughs> I mean, if you are giving me options, uh might just go with me. Oh, how kind of you. <laughs> you know what? I'm just gonna do it myself. <sighs> Fellow footy travelers, listeners, hello. This is Colin. You might recognize my voice. Mike's also here. Yeah. Hi. Anyway. We've explored the origin stories of some of our guests so far, and we've introduced the idea of the footy travelers in some of our earlier episodes. And we've realized we haven't really and fully shared our own. And we should. And we are going to. Yes, yes, Mike, you are going to share your story. Apparently, we're just going to hop right into it. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm eager. So in this episode, I'd like to share my origin story of becoming a footy traveler from a youngest child growing up in New England to a Charm City Blue continuing to seek out unique experiences while ticking off his travel list. In a future episode, I'll share my origin story as well, while probably being a little less trigger happy than Mike. Hopefully, by the end of our self-indulgent audio memoirs, you'll understand why we love not just the game of footy, but using it as a vehicle to explore the world and make legitimate connections with others throughout it. And might I add, while it's going to be a little different than our usual guest featuring episodes, there will still be lots of travel stories, soccer stories, and surely a handful of amusing ones that will have you laughing both at us and with us. Yeah, probably a few that make you laugh at us, I'm sure. So Mike, yeah, take us back to the beginning. How did you become a footy traveler? Take us back to the early 90s, probably, recalling the crisp autumn air of New Hampshire, where I would be playing Saturday morning childhood soccer with my dad as the coach. I did grow up grow up around the game. My dad was my coach for a, a lot of the years I was playing. I remember having a soccer ball at my foot pretty much as often as I could. But I had a soccer ball that was essentially twice the size of my head. And I was trying to kick it around. Look at the size of that boy's head. Your head has filled out. Well done. <laughs> Thanks. That was a big life accomplishment. It's a virtual planetoid. Has its own weather system. <laughs> I, did, uh, I did have a really good influence when I was younger. My dad's good friend, who was the gym teacher at the school that he was principal at, was the head coach of the college team in my town, Plymouth State College. Uh, what was his, his name? name? Sean, Gri Sean Griffin. And so he played at Plymouth State as a student, and then he was a coach there, and he um, had a Hall of Fame career, similar to my dad, who is also in the Plymouth State College Hall of Fame for wrestling. So they were good friends, and my dad asked if Sean could take me under his wing a little bit. And so I used to go to all of the college teams' uh, games as much as I could. And as I got older, I was like the traveling mascot for the team essentially i would i would go to their home games sometimes their away games i'd be like the ball boy water boy whatever they needed i was gonna say it sounds like a, a glorified towel boy but yes uh I, I didn't i never felt like it was um a chore it was more like hanging out with a bunch of guys that were really good at soccer and trying to learn more about it and and that was actually the first time that I got interested in the culture of soccer. 
the jerseys, the style of play, the types of players, meeting people from all around the world that played on the team. Were there international students there? Yeah. So there was one one guy that I remember who was awesome. And I, as I think about it, he must have been the first person that I had met that was some, from somewhere other than the United States. And it was his name was Paul Andrew. He was from Scotland. They called him Polly, a tremendous player. I remember just watching him and being like in awe. And then he was super nice and helped me out when I was trying to kick the ball around. And I was probably at that point, I was seven to 10 years old. But that was also the first time that I got into jerseys because Sean gave me my first like professional soccer jersey. It was a very old Inter Milan and he gave me a Flamengo jersey. And I just remember it being like kind of worn out and but I, it was just like, it was so cool. I fell in love with it. I really didn't know the significance of either of those teams or the history or anything. It was just like, it was a cool jersey that he had given or like gifted me. It's um, good that you weren't on scholarship. I guess he couldn't give those jerseys or, or any other gifts to <laughs> any of his players, huh? Yeah, exactly. Not, not in those and days. He, and I, not in those days. And I will say... The jerseys that they had, he was a, I, I think he was a big kit head as well. I think he, he still is, but he specifically wanted to get the team Diodora jerseys because Diodora was like just coming out. I think I still have one, like their, their warm up jackets and one of their game jerseys. And it's like all Diodora gear and it was so fresh. So, um, real quick, if you were six to 10 years old, born in 86, that was. 92 onward. So it was right around the time Diodora yeah. was being used by the Italian national team. Yes, which was also a thing that I adored. And the so Plymouth State College was a green and white colored jersey. That was their their school colors. But they had incorporated some like red and, and white in it too. And they did sort of like the checkered collars that the Italian national team was wearing too. So that also was a big influence because I loved the Italian team. I remember watching them in the 94 World Cup final against Brazil. For Italy to lose was a heartbreaker, but I fell in love with both of those teams. I, I loved the Italian team and I, I really liked the Brazilian team as well. I had posters of Romario and Rivaldo and Maldini and all of the guys that all the stars on both those teams I was like obsessed with. I got a room full of your posters and your pictures, man. Two of yours, the biggest fan. This is Stan. And I do remember there was always a distinct difference between like the culture of soccer and like going and playing it. And I used to love playing it. It was like my favorite sport. And I would say I was pretty good at it. But I did learn a lot from like being around a college team that like trained and practiced and had, you know, unique types of plays. And it's not like, as my dad used to call it, magnet ball, when you have a bunch of seven-year-olds just chasing after the ball, there's no form, there's no structure, there's just like chaos. You probably had a better sense of the game tactically earlier on in life than maybe a, a lot of other players. You know, am I, is that fairly yeah. fair to say? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it, it was so natural for me to be on a field. And I remember very distinctively as that age where you're sort of going from it being like a fun thing into actually feeling like you are pretty good at it. You're not just there like being athletic, but you're like, okay, I see the field. I understood spacing. I understood the tactics of like how we need to get the ball up the field. What's the best way for the ball to get to my right foot? Cause I only had a right foot. Those types of things they came very natural to me. And I think probably a lot of that was because I just was around it so much. So beyond the experience you had with that college team, exposing you to the beauty of Diodora soccer kits and the tactics, it sounds like that was also, again, around the time when Italy was wearing Diodora and you know they were playing the World Cup in the US. I think a few of our guests have mentioned that US 94 World Cup kind of as a, a jumping off point for their fandom yours coming a little bit earlier, but what was, well, I don't know, what was your fandom like during the World Cup and then afterwards? Because, and I know we'll get to this in my own origin story, but um, mine was a little after, to be honest. So you're absolutely right. The timing of it all was, I think, very significant to my fandom. You know, as I mentioned, I loved the Italian team. That's part of the reason that I started watching Chelsea when I could, even though it was difficult to watch them. 
watching any European soccer in America back in the 90s was pretty challenging. But Gianfranco Zola was like the guy that I loved watching and, and knew that he was just so special. And he started playing for Chelsea in like the late 90s. And so is that why you started following Chelsea because of kind of a single player? Yeah, I mean, I I liked them, but I didn't have like the full blown obsession until I got to watch them more frequently. So it was like in college, it was a lot easier to see them play. But I used to really like Zola. So yeah, that's when I would say my Chelsea fandom had started, but it definitely didn't reach its height of severity (laughs) until I was more of a young adult for sure. Yeah, it's gotten intense lately, huh? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's it's been uh, sadly, a, I mean, a, a great part of my life, but also can be quite a bear in terms of stress levels and alcohol intake and all the good losing things. my voice, all the good yeah. things of adult life. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I kind of had like small roots in European soccer, not roots, but like obviously having Italian heritage, like I loved that there was a connection there and that the sport was so big in Italy. You and had an interest Yeah, yeah. So then in 1995, and I remember 95 because it was significant because 94 was the World Cup. And then they announced that the Major League Soccer was forming off of the heels of how successful the 94 World Cup was. And so they had announced that there was going to be uh, a team based out of New England and that it needed a name. And so they ran a contest to have fans suggest what the team's name would be. So I remember this very clearly sitting at my babysitter Todd's kitchen table, brainstorming unique names for this New England team. And the grand prize that they said was if your team's name was selected by their judges panel, that you'd get like full season tickets and sit on the bench with the team and like hang out in the locker room and all this gear. And it was just like a dream for me. I was like, yeah, that's everything I want. Name the team and And become a part of it kind of. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It felt like, yeah, you felt like you had, you almost were part of its like, you know, constitution by being, you know, a naming member of it. So yeah, we sat down and brainstormed for what felt like a, a several hours, just like writing down different names. And once we landed on revolution, it was just like, yeah, this fits. This is, this fits for so many reasons, not just because of the historical context of like New England and the American Revolution, but also like the significant change that we were kind of seeing in American soccer culture, like with it being like a major league soccer, you know, it felt like that was big. And then also just the 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 more literal physical aspect of a ball's revolution. Mike, are you saying that you named the New England Revolution? Yeah, I am saying that I did indeed name the MLS team, the New England Revolution. And for several months, I believe that I was the only one that named them the revolution. It took an awkward moment at the opening home match uh, at Foxborough Stadium. As we were watching it, my dad and I, I remember him talking to a guy to his right, I think, uh, saying, well, yeah, my son actually named the team. And he goes, yeah, so did my daughter. And she like looks over and waves. And then like another guy, like two rows down was like, yep, my son did too. So I think it was like a total of, I don't know, like probably six or maybe seven other people that picked Revolution as well, which, you know, isn't surprising. It's not like this incredibly unique name. But at that time, as a 10 year old, I was like a little bit devastated just to mm. to know that that wasn't just mine. <laughs> you uh, you had this vision of self grandeur, perhaps as if you were the only one creating something for the world to to see or hear or experience. I, yeah. I'm glad, I'm glad you've gotten rid of that habit as, <laughs> as evidenced by our, our intro to this, you know, our intro. I need to, I need to shelf my sarcasm. Carry on, Mike, carry on, Mike. <laughs> you know, when, when things, when the spotlight is not just on me, I don't like it. I'll admit that. Well, the, the episode the is, says I need to work on that. <laughs> and here we are. We're working, here we are. working it out. <laughs> We're working it out. Exactly. <laughs> um, I will say that a funny little anecdote to that first match at Foxborough Stadium for the Rebs was the game ended in a 1-1 draw with DC United and it went to a shootout, not penalty kicks, because if you might remember, 
they did hockey style shootouts for the first several years of the MLS where they the player would start at half field and dribble at the keeper. I hated that. I thought that was so stupid. <laughs> I mean, I, I I get the argument for why they did that. They wanted American soccer to be a little different, but uh Yeah, it was, uh, it was a little bit comical. Maybe not as comical as how the Rebs finished that year. Dead last. Very, mm. very poor showing from that team. But they were also the host of the very first MLS Cup final at Foxborough, which I also went to, in which uh, we saw DC United beat the LA Galaxy on an Eddie Pope goal in the 94th minute. Nice. Win it. Sean Mendo calling for the corner. It will spin towards the box at the six. It's headed home. Eddie Pope. I was excited for and that final as a, and I'm probably getting too much into my own origin story, but I liked the LA Galaxy for Kobe Jones back then. So you do love you some Kobe. Kobe Jones, if you're listening, love you, buddy. <laughs> I never really thought about it, but he was the first Kobe in LA. Oh. This is this is true. Obviously spelled differently, but um RIP Black Mamba. So yeah, I mean that was to kind of think about my soccer fandom. I'd been to, you know, a handful of other um pretty big matches. I went to a USA Mexico World Cup qualifier match uh, at Foxborough, which is pretty crazy. I do remember having a soccer shirt that said like soccer is life, <laughs> kind of like football is life. Football is life. <laughs> But it was uh, it had a soccer ball on it, and the soccer ball was painted in uh, Italian flag colors, so it was red, white, green. There's a picture of me. I painted my face in like red, white, and blue, and I had that soccer is life shirt on, and people thought that I was like this poser because they thought that the flag was the Mexican flag, and I had my face painted red, white, and blue. So they were like, "Who do you support here?" I'm like, Pick a side. <laughs> no, I was like, I promise I'm not a Mexican supporter, but I maybe should have decided not to wear an Italian soccer shirt to that match. They could also so. know their international flags a bit better. Uh, tomato, tomato. <laughs> <laughs> pompadoro, pompadoro. Hey, everyone. We hope you're loving the show. If you are, we'd love it if you showed us your love. Here's a couple simple ways to do that. Be sure to hit subscribe or follow wherever you're listening to this episode. Even better, send this episode to a friend and tell them to listen as well. If you happen to be listening on Apple Podcasts, we'd love it if you'd leave us a star rating and write a review for us. It's a great way to help others discover our show. Finally, engage with us on Instagram. Follow, like, tag, or DM the Footy Travelers handle, at Footy Travelers. As always, if you want more info on anything you hear about in our episodes, check out the show notes or reach out to us through the contact page on FiperMedia.com. All right, back to the show. So soccer was big in my childhood, obviously, um, as a fan. And then, as I mentioned, as a player, it just felt like it came very naturally. I played striker. And loved to score some goals. Revisit three minutes ago when I said I like to be in the spotlight. So, you know, makes sense. I used to uh, I used to have a bit of an ego, I think, uh, when I played for sure. And I used to write about a lot of it too, like school assignments and stuff. I would always write about the games I played and I would design like custom jerseys for like the future club that I was going to play on. And I do remember where it sort of turned I was about to go into high school and I was like, I'm really excited to play on my high school team. And so I had like a new coach for my eighth grade team. And he he pretty much told me, you're not good enough to play striker. I was very unhappy about it. I didn't really understand what was happening. I didn't I thought I just like there was like bad blood. I was like, I, I think I'm still good enough to play this position, but whatever. But I did feel like kind of deep down, I was like, I don't know if I'm like something's going on where maybe I was regressing in my skill level. And so he just like saw it. But sure enough, like several months later, I was diagnosed with cancer. And I had like a lot of health issues that I guess had stemmed earlier than that. So I wouldn't necessarily say that the cancer was what made me a bad player, but it was almost foreboding 
to the fact that it was like, yeah, I don't really know if I'm like as fast as I used to be or could like run as long as I could. So that was a bit of a jar. And and that's, I think, when like when I tell my cancer story, I like to say like sports was such a big part of my life. And I thought that that was going to be my everything. And it was like a very, very quick taste of reality when not only can you not play the sport because I had I was like sidelined because I had to get chemotherapy and stuff. But there are a lot bigger things in life and in the world as a 13 year old than playing high school soccer. And so it's a big perspective shift. So that was big for me. Like I couldn't play summer soccer because I was getting chemotherapy. And then like the start of my freshman year of high school that I was looking so forward to because I was going to have a new coach and I'd be able to prove my worth that I still could play striker and I was still a good player. And I wasn't able to play because I had to go get radiation treatments every day. So that was really devastating. And it also was not (laughs) a great time, just as if you think about freshman year of high school is usually the most socially awkward and uncomfortable time. And I had like huge scars on my face because I was getting radiation from like my chin down to my chest. So I had I looked like a Napoleon cookie. I had like the white skin on the top and the dark skin on the bottom. There was a nickname going around that I was two tone Tyrone. Two tone Tyrone. <laughs> you could have been two tones um, before two chains was a thing. Oh man, I could have turned it into a rap career. Got to pivot. Sometimes you just got to pivot. Yeah, I just didn't. I I didn't take the opportunity. I didn't seize it well enough. Could have been Alfonso Davies before there was an Alfonso Davies. <laughs> I think he's trying to create a rap career for himself. Really? That's what the gram says, but we won't go down that oh. rabbit hole. <laughs> so yeah so i didn't get to play soccer the first two years of my high school uh career because radiation the first year and then i was pronounced cured after that and then i had a relapse so no summer soccer again so i was out of playing soccer like competitively for two plus years so that was really that's that was awful and and those are some formative years for your development as a competitive player. Just that that age, that high school age. Yes, I think that's when you're going to play more competition and you're going to learn, you know, better skills. You're going to know more about the game and just physically like I was still growing. And so chemotherapy can stunt your growth. And so there's just like a lot of factors at play. So it was it was it was disheartening because it was just a sport that I loved so much. And I think I struggled to not being able to play it. But I was also like, I have bigger and better things I need to pay attention to, with, like trying to survive. Um, and we, we so, joke that yeah. football is life, but life, uh, life can be bigger than football. Life is bigger than football. Yeah. Yes. And yeah, it was, I mean, it was touch and go for a bit. Like I had to get a stem cell transplant and go into like full isolation for several months. It was pretty, it was pretty tough and like obviously this isn't a somber story but it's more of like how it impacted who i am and how i see the world and how i find beauty in the things that i appreciate like soccer and so when i was finally healthy enough to get back and play my junior year i was like i need to make this varsity team and i need to like make a difference and almost make up for the lost time because i didn't play for two years so uh my junior year i made the varsity team didn't play a ton. Um, definitely felt like I was still trying to get my feet back on the ground, sort of like it, you know, being out of the game for two, like two years was a challenge to just remember how physical it was. And you have to think like the last time I had played competitively, I was like in eighth grade where you're not playing young men, you're playing children still. And then going into your junior, senior year, you're playing young men, you're playing people that are going to go and play collegiately somewhere. So that was, that was a challenge. Yeah, the junior year we lost in the playoffs. And I remember being like, I got to get this team to the playoffs again. And so I was named captain of our team my senior year. And first round of the playoffs in the second half of the game, we were tied. And I broke my arm. (laughs) I was going for a 50-50 ball. 50-50 ball with with a kid that was just massive. I was like, why is this kid not playing like a lineman in football? He's like playing wing back on a... b-rate team and he just took me out that was unfortunate but it felt good to be able to get back and and play the sport and so 
when I decided to go to school and went to college at Loyola, I was like, I 100% need to try to make the club team. I knew I was probably not good enough to be able to walk on to the, the D1 team that had a lot of really talented players. But I was like, all right, well, if I try out for club and maybe the magic kind of comes back and I make some waves, then who knows? Maybe I could go and uh, impress the coach and, and all that. But I, I wanted to play in college and I, I did consider going to like a D3 school just to go play. But it was also like coming to that conclusion, which was like, am I going to make a decision about my collegiate career over a sport when I just had this reality check of like, the sport is not my life kind of thing. And, yeah. and I know this because, you know, I've, I know several people that played collegiate sports and it's like when you play, especially in a D1, your whole life is essentially around that sport. So you don't have maybe as many of the social opportunities to like enjoy the other elements of college. You're always dedicated to the sport. And to me, I was like, even if I was good enough, which at the time, I don't think I really was. But if I could have maybe played on a D3 team, I still probably would have been compromising some of the social elements of college that I was looking forward to, especially after being in isolation for six months of my life. And I'm like, there's more stuff that I need to like get caught up on socially here. Well, it's uh, yeah, if I can just sorry to interrupt, but it's it sounds like you were very well thought out and mature, I think, in your decision. And, but, you know, beyond your self-centered narcissism, I think that's a great quality. I just want to point out you, you, you did a good job there. Oh, thanks. It's uh, that was very much so the uh, output or the outcome of being put through, you know, a life threatening situation. It definitely puts everything into perspective. And then from there on, I think I did pursue life with more intent. So like everything that I've that I've done, whether it's come subtly or very intentionally, everything had a purpose to like what I was trying to do. Not that I had like a, my whole life mapped out, but it was just like really thinking through decisions a little bit more. And I knew that like I felt more at home at Loyola. So fortunately, I, I think it was like the first week at Loyola they had. It was definitely the team club tryouts. The first weekend. I, and I remember missing it for a wedding. Uh -huh. That I believe was the first time that you and I met was was it club? Was it? Cl it wasn't club tryouts, but. Well, if, if we're starting to blend our two stories together, you know, my memory is that we met just socially as you were yeah. a roommate of a friend of mine who was in my hall. So, yes. Uh, yes and then true. come then come to find out we were me a, a little bit later for reasons I'll divulge at a later date than realizing we were on the club soccer team together. Yes. Yes, that is correct. The club team was awesome. I loved playing it. It was a it was like a perfect blend of competitive, talented people and maybe taking themselves a little bit too seriously for what I was interested in. But we also, you know, we, we played good. hard. We were good. We won regional we played, tournaments. We played hard games. Yeah. And yeah, we were we were and we were playing legit schools. You know, a lot of people don't know Loyola as a D1 school and don't you know it's only 3,500 students undergraduates and you're playing Penn State and Clemson and North Carolina and we performed pretty well so I do think the competitive level that that was the most competitive I had played so it was happy I was happy to be able to make the team and, and play a good amount but then also I really enjoyed the fun parts of the the club culture as well. So yeah, I, I think every person that plays sports throughout like their childhood always has their dream of like what they're going to do with their sports skills and like what their career path is going to be. And they always have to think about when is it going to end, whether you're a D1 basketball player for Davidson and you make it to the final four or you make it to the March Madness, but you're like, I'm definitely not getting drafted. The dream dies somewhere. And for me, it was sort of like, I knew I wasn't going to get to any higher level of play. And so it felt nice to know that I was like, yep, this is this is where my skills are going to take me. If I if I really worked at it, maybe I could get to another level. But like, I really enjoyed the balance of like having fun, enjoying college life while also playing soccer with people that I enjoyed. And I know some, you know, Division One athletes because of their commitment to their teams and their sports and their programs, 
they don't get to have some of those other fun, exciting, maybe even life altering experiences during college that we've had. You know, study abroad comes to mind. Traveling. Yeah. We we all know you're not only a footy fan, but a footy traveler. Anything from that college period that kind of catapulted you into the travel stuff as well? Yeah. I chose Loyola because I knew they had a really good study abroad program. Not the only reason, but that was a big selling point for me. And because my stepbrother had gone there and he studied abroad in Belgium. And I was like, I want to do the same thing because I had visited them in Belgium when I was 14. And I was like, this is incredible. Party on Wayne. (laughs) Party on guard. So I knew I wanted to study abroad. And that was another thing where it was just like, I I would feel bad for friends of mine that were D1 athletes where they would have their friends, essentially their friends that aren't athletes going and traveling and studying abroad and coming back and telling these awesome stories. And they're like, yeah, I was still here on campus. And, you know, a lot of people. Doing two a days. Yeah, exactly. And like Loyola is a big study abroad school. So junior year, you're losing, you know, almost the majority of the student body that year being abroad at some point. So I, uh, yeah, my intent was to go to Belgium and do a whole year there. Then I met a female that I was very fond of. And she convinced my, my, me my that Thailand was a really cool place to potentially study abroad. Oh, oh, you're talking about somebody else. I was going to say I, I identify as a male, but okay, never mind. Yeah, it uh, definitely wasn't you. Mm. Sorry. Mm, cool. But, uh, and I also, I mean, it wasn't just this one individual person, but I learned a lot about how great the Thailand program was through this person. And then hearing stories from other people But I had already gotten accepted into the Belgium program. And I remember um, asking uh, Father Nash, who was the program lead for Thailand, what maybe the program was about. And I remember he said, well, according to the information I have, you're already accepted into the Belgium program. So I don't know why you're asking me this question. (laughs) And so I was like, I would just really like to talk with you and, and learn a little bit more about it. And so... I went into his office and he was like, do you want to go to the Thailand program? And I was like, I I'd, I'd really am interested in it. That's why I wanted to talk to you. And he was like, well, do you want to go? And I was like, yeah. And so he's like, okay, well, you're in. And I've already canceled out your Belgium program. <laughs> I was like, oh, man. Uh, okay. Guess that's happening. <laughs> Yeah, Thailand. Uh, yeah, pretty much right after sophomore year, finished in May and flew out end of May to start my study abroad program for six months in Bangkok. And that's when the travel bug just, it didn't just bite me, it infected my entire body. <laughs> I like, I was just hooked. And I had traveled a little bit when I was younger, which was great, but like independently traveling especially in Asia, it was just, it was tremendous just going to all the Southeast Asian countries, you know, meeting all these really cool people. And I was still 19, 20 years old, you know, didn't really know what the heck I was going to do in my life, but I knew that I fit in that culture very seamlessly. And I was like hooked. I don't, I don't think I would have ever like not gotten the travel bug. I think it probably was inside me somewhere. I just needed to have it sort of sparked. But for it to be like in Southeast Asia, which was so easy to travel and just so different than any other place I'd ever been, it was just like incredibly jarring to my system. And from then on, I was like, I need to do more travel. And that is uh, why... A year and a half after coming back from Thailand to study abroad, I decided to go back to Bangkok to teach English as a second language at the same university that I studied abroad at because I just loved it so much. And it was 2008 and who the heck knew it was about to come around the corner in terms of jobs. And I was not in a mature headspace to want to start, you know, a lifelong career somewhere that I didn't really know that I wanted. So even if you could that. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, that's, uh, that's where the travel part of the travel foot or the footy traveler in me kind of came about because I never really traveled extensively for soccer as a kid, other than, you know, going on the Plymouth State College bus trips to Colby College in Maine and stuff like (laughs) it wasn't anything crazy. But yeah, that 
you know, combining that with my college career and playing a little bit of soccer and then using travel or then, you know, traveling abroad. And then it just felt like those two things for me were really big in my life. And I knew that I needed to sort of have more of both of those big passions of mine. So yeah, it's uh, I think that's kind of where it brings me to the the point of, you know, the 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 convergence of travel being so prominent in my life after studying abroad and then going back abroad to live there permanently and living in a country like Thailand that is so soccer centric. It's it, people don't realize how obsessed that country is with it, it is with soccer for a country that's not known for being good at soccer. They are very big in European soccer fandom. And you can see it in a lot of, especially English clubs have a large amount of Thai businesses as sponsors. One of the owners of uh, Leicester City was Thai and had the Visit Thailand sponsor on their jerseys for many years. King Power before that, I think. Yep. Which, just saying that probably doesn't mean a lot of things to a lot of people. King Power being the, the duty-free shop in the Bangkok airport, so on a boom airport. That is correct. And and I think I remember asking um, a friend of mine who was Thai after living there for a little while and just seeing how obsessive they were, their culture was around English soccer. And I was like, when did this happen? Like, how did this, why did this happen? And I remember he was like, it just fits so nicely in our culture because the timing of matches in England equates to like, prime time and into the evenings in Thailand. So, and I remember, and you remember this, like we would go out to bars and we'd watch English soccer matches from seven to 12 midnight. And like, that was your night. And instead of like in America where you're like, you're waking up at 7 a.m. and trying to find a bar that would be open for it. So it was just like accessibility to the sport is very big there. And that's, I think, another reason that that's really where my Chelsea fandom grew even more because I could watch matches all the time. Whereas like in college, I would try to catch a Chelsea match, but it was college. Am I going to wake up at, you know, 8 a.m. to watch my favorite club play when I was out drinking all night before? Probably only, not. Only if you're still up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I I love you. I love hearing about you. I love in, I love indulging you in your stories. But maybe this is a good point to step back and maybe this is a good point for me to introduce the idea of our shared experience in Thailand. You know, I remember a few times going to Raja Mangala Stadium and seeing the Thai national team play in the AFC or playing in the AFC Cup. So not that I want to cut you off, but I'm going to cut you off. But you're good at that. I'm you're good at cut. that. You... I'm just going to cut. I'm just going to. I'm trying. <laughs> Uh, 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 I'm trying to cut you off. You do it so well. Let's wrap Although, this episode. Sometimes you wish you could cut me off sooner. I know. God, you're winning this Fine. battle. You're winning this battle. The and floor it is yours. The, the floor is yours. Anyway, I think this is good for an episode. Let's uh, let our listeners go. Listeners, thanks for tuning into Mike's origin story. Hopefully, you know a little bit more about where he's coming from and what his experiences were growing up exploring the world of footy, and developing a bug for travel. In one of our future episodes, not entirely sure yet when, but I'll share my story just as Mike shared his, and we'll reconnect those two threads into the larger fabric of who we see ourselves as in the footy travelers. I like to say it's the birth of the footy travelers. They are born. <laughs> Cue angelic music. Until next time, everyone, be loud, be passionate, and be good to each other. The Footy Travelers Podcast is a production of Fiper Media. To learn more about their other work, visit FiperMedia.com. That's F-Y-P-E-R media.com. Our episodes are edited by me, Colin Martin. Mike Tyrone is our creative director. Cover art is by Felix Palau. Theme music comes from Shumatar, with additional music from Mr. Mastermind. Our incredible intro voice is Helen Mars. 
You can keep up with all things footy travel by following us on Instagram at footy travelers. We'll see you next time.